All right, so welcome to Dental CE Academy, exploring the oral gut brain axis in dentistry. And I was really excited to put this course together. I have been presenting a course on the gut brain microbiota axis since 2014 and probiotics since 2014. And I thought I really knew everything I needed to know about the gut brain and microbiota axis until two years ago, almost two years ago, um, I developed a Clostridium difficile infection that followed a periodontal procedure and a prescription for clindamycin that I later found out I didn't need. And that set an entire course of um, recovery for me. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So again, welcome to the class. So we're going to talk about microbial communities today, the oral microbial communities and the gut micro, uh, microbes. And we're going to talk about eubiosis and homeostasis, and then we're going to talk what, about what happens when the balance of these communities become disrupted, which is called dysbiosis or dysbacteriosis. And we know that dysbiosis of the oral uh, microbes as well as the gut communities precede many oral and systemic diseases. Cancer, autoimmune-related conditions, inflammatory states, and it can involve the breakdown of innate barriers. We'll see colonization, resistance, uh, leaky gut, immune dysregulation, pro-inflammatory signaling, and molecular mimicry. <clears throat> Learning objectives are in your handout. And again, I hope that you have the handout. For those of you watching the recording later, please scroll down below the video player. Number two in the instructions is the handout. Number three is your quiz for on demand. <clears throat> when we talk about the gut microbiome or the oral microbiome or the microbiota, are those terms interchangeable? No. The microbiome is a collective uh, genome. It's the genetic makeup of the community of these microorganisms in a particular environment. So whether the oral cavity or the, uh, the GI system. And when we talk about the microbiota, we're talking about the community of microorganisms. So that's the difference. We're talking either microbiome, which is like the metagenome of that community, or we're talking about just the community itself. And the human microbiome is made up of bacteria primarily, but also viruses, archaea, which are these sort of primitive um, creatures, if you will, fungi, slime molds, amoeba, they all colonize the human gut with bacteria being the most common. So we're going to start now with the gastrointestinal um, ecosystem, if you will. This community of microbes forms at birth, all right? And it changes continuously throughout life. Depending on your life experiences, um, microbial composition of the gut of healthy people, highly specific but dynamic equilibrium, constantly in flux, homeostasis. And the gastrointestinal tract, especially the colon, because it is uh, slightly higher pH than the small intestine and greatly higher in pH than the stomach, it's the most colonized, colonized excuse me, 70% 70, 70 of the total. All right, so when we talk about the human microbiome, we're actually talking about almost a separate organ, what was also termed a virtual organ of the body. The human genome, 23,000 genes. The microbiome encodes 3 million plus genes. It produces thousands of metabolites. It influences the host fitness, phenotype, health, and it dictates the balance between health and pathology. And again, that is a constant uh, homeostasis it's constantly in flux. It's constantly in balance. It's trying to check itself. Now, let's talk about the gut microbiota in more detail. It's most abundant and diverse of the human microbiota. 10 to the 14th microorganisms. That's 10 and 14 zeros. That's a lot. If you 
were able to calculate your mass, you could subtract 10% off the top dedicated to the mass of these microbes that live on and within you. Now, gut colonization occurs and is shaped by birth and delivery mode. So the infant's colonized with the mother's skin, saliva, vaginal secretions, and feces. Infants that are born by C-section have a different encounter. So they're inoculated slightly different and they may not have the full benefit of being inoculated with some of these protective qualities. Now, later environment and host physiology will influence this colonization until the infant matures at about two years of age. And at that point, their gut microbiota is going to mirror that of the adults that they live with, um, their pets perhaps, life's experience and anything else, diet and so forth. So definitely introducing solid foods to infants helps this process at some point. Now, when we talk about eubiosis, we're talking about symbiosis with the host. So the microbes are living, this micro, microbe community, if you will, living symbiotically with the host. Again, homeostatic, homeostatic balance or eubiosis, okay? And we want this, this is what we aim for. This is what the body requires. So in, eubio in a eubiotic state, there are numerous physiologic functions that occur. Nutrient conversion, vitamin formation, immune tolerance, hepatic health. It controls the bi-directional communication between the enteric brain or the second brain or the enteric nervous system, excuse me, and the CNS, the central nervous system. This is called the gut-brain microbiota axis. And if anybody has any questions, please be sure to let me know by typing them in to the chat area. So I think the gut-brain microbiota axis is sort of the control switch. It's controlling this bi-directional communication that, be that occurs between the enteric nervous system and the central nervous system. And again, the enteric nervous system is called the uh, second brain. It is the brain of the gut. So if you think of um, getting butterflies in your stomach before a test, um, the switch that turns us off, hopefully, when we're eating too much of, some, of a good thing, right? Satiation. This has to do with the enteric nervous system. And again, that's very simplistic because the enteric nervous system is quite complex. All right, so just looking at a very simple diagram here of the gut-brain axis, um, again, it's bi-directional. So the microbes in the gut, when they are in a eubiotic state, will help support the central nervous system and all of its functions, right? And when the microbes are not in a eubiotic state, when they're not living symbiotically with the rest of the host, there are things that can go haywire here. Uh, neurotransmitters may not fire correctly. SSRIs, for instance, uh, or SSRs, for instance. Um, anxiety, other mood disorders have been linked to dysbiosis as well as if somebody develops um, a stress type disorder or they're under a lot of stress or they're not taking care of themselves, they're not getting a lot of sleep and so forth, that can exert an effect on the gut microbiota as well. So again, it is bi-directional. So it's very important that we keep the gut microbiota intact in a healthy state anything that disrupts that can affect all of these various pathways. And that goes for prescribing antibiotics. When we prescribe an antibiotic, we're actually responsible for some of this. So we would need to make darn sure that that patient needs that antibiotic, right? Because it can be a lifetime of hurt. All right, healthy gut microbiota or healthy, healthy gut bacteria, for instance, here, the phyla, Formicutes. Now, Formicutes makes up in a healthy gut bacteria about 30 to 50 percent. 
followed by bacteroidetes, 20 to 40%, actinobacteria, 1 to 10%, and to a very few um, uh, amount, the proteobacteria, a few levels. So what's important to note about Firmicutes, we're going to later talk about fecal transplants, is that these super donors are encouraged to eat foods that are going to help produce a gut microbiota, if you will, plentiful with Firmicutes, all right? Proteobacteria can be pathogenic in certain cases, as we'll see. And again, welcome to all of us joining us live and be sure you have the handout tap on the banner at the top of the screen and the CE credit instructions so you will get credit after the course today. I am going to go ahead and we'll reshare the instructions and make sure that you all have a copy of that as well. Thank you. All right, so again, Formicutes has a very important role in the healthy gut bacteria. It's important to know that the gut microbes and the gut microbiota is not just this static group of bacteria that just happen to be swimming in a pool, all right? They have their own microbe communities. So they develop sort of their own little tribes, if you will. And those little tribes have amazing um, uh, pathways, if you will, amazing activities that help physiological processes in the human body. So when we're recommending probiotics to our patients, it's very simplistic of us to think about the fact that we are really going to affect this very dynamic community by prescribing the or recommending these probiotics. In fact, there are um, concerns that we might be disrupting diversity and even density of the micro microbes by using probiotics. And that's a very controversial topic that we'll talk about. But I want you to know what these three, what are called entrotypes are. These are bacteria clusters or these subcommunities, if you will. Entrotype one. Entrotype one is a result of the Western diet. High fats, high proteins, and primarily the microbes that we see would be bacteroides and parabacteroides species, primarily bacteroides. Entrotype two is more of a high fiber diet, one that includes carbohydrates, vegetables and fruits. And that one is known as the Prevotella entrotype, entrotype two. It's a bit more desirable than the entrotype one. And then entrotype three is the one we see most frequently and it's called the Ruminococcus uh, entrotype. So I wanna talk about the role of the gut microbiota to limit pathogens, pathogenic presence and preserve homeostasis, which is the role of the gut microbiome. Number one role, all right? This term is called colonization resistance. The colon is able to protect itself from pathogens two ways, from this aspect, colonization resistance, and from the immune system hematological, the blood. We're gonna talk now about colonization resistance. So these microbes produce short chain fatty acids. Butyrate, acetate, propionate, they help to maintain and repair the colonic epithelium. You've heard of leaky gut, these junctions that become, um, uh, they lose their uh, connections and it allows bacteria to seep from the gut into the bloodstream. This is what they're talking about at this level. And these short chain fatty acids are produced mainly by the phyla, as we spoke of earlier, Formicutes and Bacteroidetes. And they do this through direct action and this would be the short chain fatty acids. And we're gonna give a demonstration here, butyrate, primary energy source for the colonic epithelial cell maintenance. 
expansion and differentiation of the regulatory T cells, CD4s, that modulate immune activity. That's the second direct action, as well as they compete for nutritional and physical niches. And the, that is known collectively as colonization resistance. So again, I'm going to bring you back to prescribing antibiotics. When you prescribe antibiotics, you are going to exert an effect on colonization resistance. Then we have an indirect action. So Bacteroides thuringiensis secretes a bacteriocin. That's a protein that targets clostridium of all strains or various strains, but, or species, um, Clostridioides difficile, which we just had a question in the survey, and some of the rods, some of the bacilli, all right? That's one indirect action. Also stimulates the immune system and initiates the host defenses via TLRs. What are those? Toll-like receptors. Toll-like receptors are members of the pattern recognition receptor family. And this is part of the immune system and they recognize microorganism specific molecular patterns. So they're on watch all the time. If they see something that, that they don't recognize, they're going to launch an immune uh, response, okay? Very simplistic, but that's what they do. They secrete a bacterial antigen. In this case, it's lipopolysaccharide and flagellum. When we have a change in homeostasis, we can exert an effect that could possibly be pathogenic, right? So when we, again, prescribe antibiotics, and we disrupt this homeostasis, there can be a shift to this pathogenic uh, community. I'm, I'm a living result of that right now, folks, and we'll talk about that. This can be a result of what? Nutritional changes, diet, antibiotics, certainly, chemotherapy, environmental factors that disrupt colonization resistance often characterized by disproportionate amount of proteobacteria and decrease in bacterial diversity. Now, proteobacteria are linked to inflammatory diseases in the gastrointestinal system and the lungs. Formicides, bacteroidides represent a large proportion of the gastrointestinal microbiota and to exert any sort of influence on them, it would require a, quite a significant population shift to cause pathology. Antibiotics can do that. We've seen that. We've seen the results. The marginalized bacteria, these are the bacteria that get pushed to the side because the good guys, so to speak, are competing for nutrition and other niches. So these other marginalized bacteria like perhaps if your patient's a carrier of Clostridium difficile, may be pushed to the back. And because it, it doesn't have the same influence, the same numbers as Formicides, it's not exhibiting any issues. However, if we prescribe an antibiotic, note lesser shifts in the marginalized bacteria may exhibit more of a profound effect. So when we're prescribing antibiotics and we're recommending probiotics, it's a bit of a crapshoot, right? We don't, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't have any ways to really look inside that patient's colon and to see, see if they can defend themselves from a C. diff infection, right? So again, marginalized bacteria, C. difficile, can exhibit a much more prone effect with a little bit of a change. Now, I put this up here, and you'll see the citation below. And this is um, specific gastrointestinal microorganisms according to GI health status. And you'll see formicides and so forth, uh, bacteroidides, typical healthy GI microbiome. And in health, you'll see listed here bacteroides species, parabacteroides, Prevotella, 
uh, disulfo vibrio. Disulfo vibrio is also, I believe, um, along with the um, entrococcus uh, type two. So we'll we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and then dysbiosis, what do we see? In individuals with what's called low gene richness, LGR or low species richness, um, oftentimes from antibiotics or diet, you may see an increase in uh, increase non-proportionally and have the genomic potential to secrete metabolites that negatively impact the host, and that's bacteroides. So it has a different effect on the bacteria. Obesity, we're going to talk about. Diabetes, we're going to talk about. Certainly inflammatory bowel diseases. Um, it has been um, uh, demonstrated that E. coli, for instance, ruminococcus, which we saw in the uh, type 3, Patients with IBD have been shown to promote inflammation or the species to promote inflammation, increase mucus degradation, uh, damage epithelial cells, increase intestinal permeability, and so forth. And GI cancer. So we'll talk about colorectal cancer here as well. So this is just a good overview for you. And we're going to touch on a few of these. We just have an hour, so we're not going to be able to do a deep dive in all of those. So let's talk about obesity and diabetes as an example. Bacteroides enter a type fat Western diet, high fat, implicated in the development of diabetes due to low microbial gene richness. And the bacteroides enter a type and LGR are associated with obesity. Now, LG LGR individuals present also with increased insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, and elevated predisposition to diabetes. And in high microbial gene ri richness, HGR, which is associated with the enterotype 2, right, Prevotella enterotype 2, decreased adipose tissue, so less obesity, lower levels of circulating cholesterol, and decreased inflammation. And remember what the diet looked for, like for those. So Bacteroides enterotype 1 was that Western diet, high fat, high protein, and uh, enterotype 2 was your Prevotella enterotype. More fiber, more carbs. Okay, colorectal cancer. Several bacteria have been suspected to aid in colorectal cancer oncogenesis. Streptococcus bovis, Helicobacter pylori, Bacteroides fragilis, E. facilis, Fusobacterium, which should sound familiar to a lot of you, and E. coli. Now, of note, you may want to be aware that patients that have had C. difficile are at higher risk for developing colorectal cancer. Now, Fusobacterium nucleatum, that we know is linked to periodontitis, is also found in higher levels in colorectal adenomas when compared to the adjacent mucosa. So we're going to talk now about the oral microbiome a little bit, and then we're going to talk about their interaction. Any questions or comments? The CE is being recorded. It will be available in the future. And be sure to ask questions by typing into the chat area for me. I love questions. Doesn't mean I know the answers to all of the questions, but I'll try. If we had any latecomers, please tap on that red banner at the top of the screen to get your handout and your CE credit instructions. All right, let's talk now about the oral microbiome. Okay, oral cavity is sterile, to, uh, sterile prior to birth. When you're in utero, the oral cavity is sterile. No bacteria, no microbiome. Colonized and shaped during delivery and then later feeding methods, right? So we said in the gut situation, the gut microbiota colonized and shaped by the type of delivery, C-section versus vaginal delivery. In this case, it is the same. And also how that infant is fed, whether the infant is breastfed or for formula fed. Primarily streptococcus species and the adult human oral cavity we see 200 species of bacteria and over 600 are commonly found 
in the broader adult population. Okay. Composition and impact on health and disease factors that dictate a bacterial localization because the they head, the mouth, there are various cavities and so forth that bacteria can localize. Nutrient availability, host immune exposure, oxygen content, and temperature. When we talk about the core taxa, that would be the phyla that is common to all of us. We're talking about Bacteroidetes, Formicutes, Actinobacteria, Proteobacteria, Fusobacteria. And when we talk about initial colonization, we're talking about Streptococcus mitis found on the buccal mucosa, salivarius, the saliva or the dorsal aspect of the tongue, and then sanguis found on tooth surfaces. And these microbes alter the pH and the available nutrients, and they leave room for additional colonizers. Now, as the infant matures, these additional colonizers step up to the plate, Fusobacterium is one, and no surprise that it would be hanging out in the subgingival biofilm, right? Anaerobic. You're going to have Megan talk to you about that after my portion. All right, so eubiosis here, phyla in the oral microbiome, we see Streptococcus, Granulocatella, Neisseria, Haemophilus, Cornibacterium, Moravia, Actinomyces, Prevotella, Capnocytophagia, Porphyromonas, and Fusobacterium. In dysbiosis, we see a shift in the homeostasis, just not like the gut, but when the shift in homeostasis takes place, we now have dysbacteriosis or dysbiosis. In this case, what happens is one or others take over. It's a niche. It's homeostasis time. So if somebody decides to leave the flock, somebody else is going to try to get in there and compete for nutrients, etc. And that's what happens here. And that shift is what leads to caries, periodontitis, and endodontic infections. And we're going to touch on a few of these in just a minute here, but oral bacteria linked to numerous oral systemic diseases, in this case, highlighting the importance of oral microbial homeostasis and the maintenance of health and prevention of pathology. So um, we're going to look dental caries a little bit more deeper here. Of course, periodontal disease, endodontic disease, atherosclerotic plaques, um, pneumonia, and we have these others also in the link here for you as well. All right, so um, here is the breakdown here of specific oral microorganisms according to their oral health status. Take a look at those. I'm going to be reviewing a few of those with you. When we talk about dental caries, um, it was thought that mutant streptococcus was the primary factor or the keystone bacteria in driving the disease of dental caries. We're going to see that newer studies implicate other bacteria as well in the pathogenesis of dental caries in subjects where 10 to 20 percent with dental caries had non-detectable levels of mutant streptococci. They're replaced with low pH tolerant non-mutant streptococci, so bifidobacterium dentium, lactobacillus species, uh, scardovia wigsii, I love that name, strongly associated with severe early childhood caries in the presence or absence of mutant streptococci found in over 50% of children diagnosed with severe early childhood caries. So mutant streptococci, I call this the takeover because mutant streptococci really found its niche when the diet shifted to more refined flour and sugar. It is able to survive this increase in acidic metabolites that are formed from those substrates, right? also an increased ability to resist higher levels of oxidative stress, and it increased survival because it was able to outcompete the lesser cariogenic bacteria. So it took over the niche, and the lesser cariogenic bacteria sort of hanging out there in the wings.
Periodontite, a similar dysbiotic organization as caries, different pathways, however, and mechanisms. And we'll talk about that now. So in 1998, Sokransky and co-workers uh, co reported that periodontitis was better represented through these complexes that we're all familiar with of bacteria, rather than just identifying a single etiologic uh, agent or bacteria. Now, um, AA, Tanarella, Forsythia, certain Prevotella, Treponema species, all have been implicated in periodontitis, but specific bacterial combinations, these complexes, are recognized as better indicators of disease. And most well-known being the red complex, right? Consisting of what? Porphyromonas gingivalis, T. forsythia, treponemia, denticola. When we look at pulpal infections, the primary infection of the dental pulp um, commonly observed is Peptostreptococcus, Dialister, uh, Parvimonas micra, Fusobacterium nucleatum, uh, Filofactor allosis, and I'll let you read the rest here, Prevotella, P. gingivalis, uh, PG, and so forth. And significant but lower levels of Enterococcus facilis. Now, root canal treatment, retreatment, elevates the level of E. facilis and the others here as well. What about atherosclerotic plaque as, it, as it's related to um, the oral microbiome? Well, implicated in the pathogenesis, pathogenesis of atherosclerotic sclerotic plaque, including T. forsythia, P. gingivalis, AA, P. intermedia. And P. gingivalis stimulates epithelial production of the following. Interleukin-6. Interleukin-6 in this case, acts as a pro-inflammatory cytokine. In some cases, it will downregulate inflammation. In this case, it's pro-inflammatory. Um, interferon gamma, or what's called type 2 interferon, it's a cytokine critical for the innate and adaptive immunity against viral, some bacterial, and protozoan infections. And then tumor necrosis factor alpha. That's an inflammatory cytokine produced by macrophages, Monocytes during acute inflammation, responsible for a diverse range of signaling events within the cells, leading to necrosis or apoptosis, also important for the resistance to infection and cancers. So again, P. gingivalis stimulates the production of these cytokines. Now, in atherosclerotic plaque, it leads to local inflammatory processes it degrades oral gingival tissue and it allows for bacterial access into the bloodstream. And destruction of the oral tissue, the blood barrier allows for the spread of these bacteria and their byproducts into the circulating bloodstream. It enables access then to the coronary atherosclerotic plaque. Bacteria found in these plaques also form complex biofilms that mirror dental plaque and consist of three stages of colonization with uh, fusiform nucleatum serving as the bridging species. Pneumonia, implicated as a causative agent of pneumonia, including P. gingivalis, intermedia, AA, capnocytophagia, um, Iconella carotens, and S. constellatus. Why is this important? Or pathogens, there are two indirect roles in the pathogenesis of pneumonia. Modification of the oral cavity's innate immunity. So enzymes that are secreted by the periodontal pathogens degrades mucins and the salivary pellicle. And this reduces the body's ability to clear pathogenic respiratory bacteria from the mouth and also exposes these adhesion sites that allow them to bind to structures in the oral cavity. The other is cytokine production. And cytokines produced by the oral immune response to periodontal bacteria. And here are several interleukins and TNF alpha are aspirated into the lower respiratory tract. And once in the lower respiratory tract, these cytokines will recruit inflammatory cells that damage the respiratory epithelium and they increase susceptibility to respiratory uh, pathogens. Now, Of note, aspiration pneumonia 
is a huge risk to older adults. One in 10 older adults living in a residence like long-term care, nursing homes, et cetera, have a risk from dying from aspiration pneumonia here in the US. One in 10, that data is a hard, fast fact. We can't dispute it. In fact, here, the Veterans Administration in Phoenix, which had some not so good publicity a while back, uh, but they've changed their ways. They had um, posters hanging in their hallways, in the elevators, this one in 10 risk. They were searching for patients that were either homebound and so forth to try to get them care because they know the risk of aspiration pneumonia. Now, also to note that when you send in a team to provide oral hygiene at least once a week, you can improve these numbers. So a facility that I was associated with here in the county, a mobile program, we did just that. We trained dental assistants who would go to these various facilities once a week, brush, floss, interproximal cleaning, rinsing, just once a week made a huge difference for these patients. The oral gut link, we have to take a look. So we spoke about the oral microbiome, we spoke about the gut microbiome. Now we're going to see how their interplay occurs. So oral and gut microbiomes have varying types of bacterial species, but they're connected, right? We eat food, we swallow it, where does it go? Hopefully it goes into the gut. Um, evidence suggests that over half of the bacterial species in the syst uh, GI system undergo this oral to GI translocation, even without pathology. So half of the bacterial species in the GI system undergo oral gut translation, translocation. So when we look at this diagram here, what do we need to know? There are two ways for this translocation to take place. One is enteral, so swallowing, for instance. We swallow the bacteria and it makes its way all the way to the gut. It bypasses the stomach acids in some cases. Stomach acid, HCl, hydrochloric acid is there to do what? One of, the, one of its roles is to sterilize your food. So someone who's on a PPI loses the ability to um, keep the bacteria in check. So they may get a helio, uh, heliobacter pylori infection from overgrowth, right? Hem hematogenous bloodstream infection. So this is uh, bacteria from let's say a dental infection. In this case, um, it is passed from the bacteria on this tooth and it makes its way to the gastrointestinal tract through the bloodstream. Oral bacteria that are found in the gut of patients with GI disease are members of uh, Staphylococcus, Porphyromonas, Velinella, Fusobacterium, AA, and Parvimonas. And I do have the diagram here for you here, the uh, link between the significance of oral and GI microorganisms and specific systemic diseases. And you'll see atherosclerotic plaques, uh, pneumonia, systemic lupus erythematous, um, Sjogren's syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis. So we're going to take an aside now. I can't think of anything more disrupting um, to one's health than Clostridium difficile. And it is caused by disruption of colonization resistance. It can be antibiotics, it can be cancer therapy, it can be someone who is on medications um, to suppress their immune system, or they may have a disease or condition that suppresses their immune system, HIV AIDS patients, for instance, right? So in my case, a year ago, January the 11th, as a matter of fact, I had a dental procedure and 30 days later, I developed acute symptoms that turned out to be Clostridium difficile. And I wanna show you what Clostridium difficile does to a person over five months. I had three recurrent infections 
I was hospitalized four times. I lost over 30 pounds. I weighed 92 pounds on that in that photo on the right-hand side. Um, the photo on the left-hand side was me just a couple of days before I became symptomatic. Photo of me in the center was my fourth hospital admission. I did not respond to antibiotics. And then the photo of me on the right, my son took a day after I had a fecal microbiota transplant to save my life. This was from a six day course of clindamycin that I did not need. It was a defense prescription. We do not have science to prove that prescribing defensively will prevent infection after a surgical procedure. Doesn't exist. We have quite a bit of data that we can do this to a patient though. Half a million become infected in the US every year, 30,000 die, 15% within the first 30 days of infection. I'm going to show you a quick video here. And these are six experts that talk about outpatient settings and Clostridium difficile, because many of you believe, according to the survey, that patients must be carriers. They receive an antibiotic. It disrupts the microbe community of, of microbes and allows a niche for this C. difficile to take over, right? And that is the case, but in the general population here, 0.4 to 15% are actually carriers. I would be in that 15%. I may be a carrier of spores for the rest of my life, right? I'm a risk to your dental practice, especially if you're not using products that um, mitigate for C. difficile spores. And C. difficile spores are everywhere in the natural environment. So you're going to hear it's, it takes two things to become infected with C. difficile. One, the antibiotic, and two, coming into contact with contamination. And you as healthcare providers, the next time you take an antibiotic, you're at even greater risk of developing C. difficile by working in a healthcare environment. Hospitals inform their employees of this. Medical clinics inform their um, employees of this. You're going to hear how these spores can actually follow you home and infect your So let's talk about community C. diff if we could for a moment. Uh, uh, what are the risk factors in, in the community and how do they differ in the community versus the, the hospital-based uh, population here? Dale, you want to start us on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good uh, question because um, there's two factors that we need to have in order to get C. diff. One is antibiotic use and the other is uh, exposure to the spores. So the spores are ubiquitous. They're out in the environment. They even contaminate at a very low level some foods, meats, uh, root vegetables, lettuce, and those are probably how patients in the community get exposed. They, um, on the other hand, uh, when the CDC has looked at community-associated C. diff, they found that about 80% of these patients have had an exposure to healthcare as an outpatient. So it's doctor's office, dental office, and uh, you know, chronic dialysis units, uh, ambulatory surgery. And this is where you have two risks. One is that somebody's going to give you an antibiotic, and that those are called doctors. And, uh, <laughs> and we they, hope it's only they, doctors. They, they put people <laughs> at risk of C. diff. And, uh, and the other exposure is that the healthcare environment is more contaminated with C. diff spores than is the environment outside of healthcare. And I think it's worth noting, Paul, Paul is nodding his head, you had a lot of nodding. <laughs> uh, it's not just the people who are in the healthcare system. It's not just the people who got the antibiotics. They go home, they've got spores, and then their families are exposed. So uh, it seems to me that that's, that's part of the, the issue, isn't it? And those, yes. spores, those spores can live for a significant period of time on many different surfaces, even when exposed to sunlight. And you know, you'll see some data that says, alcohol and certain um, certain products can kill the spores, but 
that it really has to be used properly where they where the, the liquid sits on a surface for a significant period of time to have its effects. So the fact that the spores can be taken home with you on your lab coat and, and in your house and on your on surfaces for six months or a year or longer uh, certainly put people at risk. Okay, so um, again, two things, antibiotics and C. difficile spore in the environment, spore contamination in the environment. And you heard them call out dental practices there, right? Um, it used to be prevailing thought that it was mostly a hospital infection. Hospitals have it under control now. Um, the, the levels have declined and they do get outbreaks, but we've seen a significant rise in outpatient settings, including dental practices. Um, if you're still prescribing clindamycin, think again. Again, the American Dental Association no longer recommends it because of the box warning for C. difficile and the number of dentists that are now getting sued because their patients have either become very ill or have died from C. difficile. And we have two resources here for you, two classes, both on our website. Dr. Paul Meyer is the ADA's co-author for the guidelines. It doesn't get any better than that. Three and a half hours, make sure that if you don't know what to prescribe to your penallergic patients or you don't know the latest guidelines, take that class. We have this one with Dr. Goff. They've worked together and she also lectures to dentists all over the U.S. and her class is one and a half credits. And Dr. Palmeyer is also going to give you a course or a handouts that should be beneficial that you can actually use in your practice. Any questions or comments? I'm gonna show you another quick video here as we wind down. This is Dr. Justin Zaleski, and he is not just recommending Dr. Deborah Goff's uh, course, but he's talking about how he changed antibiotic prescribing in his practice. And he is a periodontist. Hello, my name is Dr. Justin Zaleski and I am a practicing periodontist in the DC area. Um, I met Debbie Goff about a year ago and it was one of the most eye-opening lectures that I have probably been part of in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Um, since I first heard her lecture, I've actually heard her lecture two more times because I've actually brought her in to speak to different groups that I'm part of multiple times. Um, every time I get something new, and like I said, it was very eye-opening for me and it completely changed the way that we are utilizing antibiotics in our practice. We used to, you know, just blanket prescribe seven to 10 days of amoxicillin. Um, we're no longer doing that. We're down to three to five day doses of antibiotics. Um, clinomycin is no longer a part of the practice, which it should be, not be a part of anyone's practice. Um, but even more importantly, it's changed my questioning of patients to, to ask more about C. diff, which is a major problem. And, you know, unbeknownst to me, just in the last six months, I've identified three C. diff patients that had C. diff in the past that if I had not gone through this lecture and met Debbie, I would have just treated them as normal and put both them and myself at risk. So I hope you guys enjoy your time with her. She has a lot of great information. And I hope it's as life-changing for you as it was for me. So thank you. Okay, and again, that lecture is right here for you. And it's available on demand um, anytime you'd like to take it. No charge. All right, so we do have a course on C. difficile. And the link is there for you. That's a course that I present. Oral microbiota dysbi dysbiosis that leads to uh, GI dysbiosis. And the question is, can microbial dysbiosis in the oral cavity preci precipitate dysbiotic conditions in the GI tract that may trigger systemic disease? And we do have evidence of that here. Now, periodontitis, oral dysbiosis, key bacteria, fusiform nucleatum, AA, P. gingivalis, and the oral microbiota of patients with colorectal cancer was distinct and predictive in this study, showing prominent oral fusiform nucleotum levels with subsequent studies confirming the presence of identical clones of oral 
fusiform nucleatum in the lesions, the colorectal cancer lesion biopsies. The presence of P. gingivalis in the GI microbiota has been linked to inflammatory autoimmune diseases associated with gastrointestinal dysbiosis, including rheumatoid arthritis, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that warrants further research into the connection. Therapeutics to reverse microbial dysbiosis. We have fecal microbiota transplant, which I underwent a year and a half ago. And it's a therapy that's performed by acquiring a stool sample from a healthy individual and transferring that sample to the patient. At that time, it was via colonoscopy under deep sedation. Um, and the goal here is to try to achieve a eubiosis state again, right? Because the gut gets wiped out. Even taking antibiotics for C. diff also wipe out the good guys. Now, success rate here is well over 90%. And we just have more information there for you. Prebiotics, probiotics, and symbiotics as we close here. The American Dental Association states that there's insufficient data to support the effectiveness of recommending probiotics and preventing C. diff infection. And they do not recommend the administration of that for that purpose at this time. Probiotics are supplements. They're not FDA approved. In fact, there's not a probiotic that is FDA approved. So we're essentially recommending to our patients to ingest bacteria, in some cases yeast, like uh, Saccharomyces boulardii is a yeast, to help, op help, op help offset potential C. diff infection. There is no proof that it does that. And um, we don't have a crystal ball, so we're not able to know what does this patient have on board to begin with, right? All right, we also have um, the ADA's link here for you for the prophylaxis guidelines, the updated and odontogenic and therapeutic use. And you will get that with the other antibiotic courses that we offer. Um, what are other the antimicrobial therapies? Of course, we have antimicrobial rinses. We have antimicrobial J or gel or tray therapy that Megan will be talking about shortly. And the newest and latest here is targeted precision medicine, bacteriocins, uh, bacteriophages, and engineered phage therapy. And I was just having a discussion today with one of our presenters coming up in March and Dr. Larry Page. And Dr. Larry Page is a periodontist out of Temple um, and he is in Maryland. And he was talking about phage therapy and a patient that they were actually able to get phage therapy for. We are running out of antibiotics. Antibiotics are no longer working to the level that they once were. And we have no new antibiotics being developed because big pharma does not find it profitable. So this is another hopeful strategy. Any questions here? And I went a couple of minutes over and I'm gonna bring up uh, Megan's. So what kind of dental whites kill C. difficile? Hypochlorous acid, you can reach out to me and I can send you to uh, various resources. Is there a res risk of C. diff infection after single dose of clindamycin before a dental procedure? Absolutely, take our course. One single dose can lead to C. difficile infection. Um, what type of dental procedure did I have? How did I know it was the dental office? So I had a simple extraction of number three and a socket graft with PRF. And I returned 30 days later. And within 48 hours of that return visit, I developed C. difficile infection, and I don't have proof that it came from the um, dental office. However, the research that we've done and we're now involved in, and I'm now a national spokesperson, I have pretty good evidence that it probably did come from contamination because dental practices aren't immune from this contamination. Um, and after every one of the classes that I present, I'm going to have a handful of you that reach out to me and say, you know, um, I worked in a Navy clinic and I got C. diff when I had a sinus infection. I've heard you talk on C. diff and understand the need to try to avoid clindamycin. What are you using for heart valve replacement, pre-medication, and amoxicillin Keflex allergy? So I am going to refer you to Dr. Uh, Paul Meyer's course, and it's a decision tree that he offers to you. So it's not 
necessarily a black and white answer there, Scott. So I would take the class first. Um, is this only with clindamycin or other antibiotics? Any antibiotic, any dose, any duration can cause C. difficile. When I had C. difficile, uh, there was um, a 17 year old being treated by my gastroenterologist, wisdom teeth, third molar removal, amoxicillin, C. diff, 17 years of age, no risk factors. So understand this, anybody in this virtual room today, the next time you take antibiotics, make sure you need them, number one. We need antibiotics from time to time, they're life-saving. Make sure you need them, all right? If you have an ongoing cough and it's viral, you don't need an antibiotic, you're putting yourself at risk. What about the patients that you have coming in that you're giving clindamycin to and for a prophylaxis and then you're having them come back in two weeks for crown prep and they're dosing up again and then they're coming back two weeks later for some restorative care. We have to get out of this mindset of the way we prescribe. So we have to take a look at this um, and it's called antibiotic stewardship. Is there a probiotic regimen that you recommend to be given routinely even um, needed for antibiotics? I don't have one that I recommend. Um, I would have your patient and you discuss with the primary care physician to make sure that the patient is a candidate for probiotics as well. Uh, Stephanie, why no more clindamycin? Because it has the greatest risk for C. difficile infection. Does reducing the course duration reduce the risk? So in some cases it can, but clindamycin, if you look at the other antibiotics, doxycycline carries um, lesser risk. Clindamycin would be up here, okay? So clindamycin does not need to be a part of any dental practice. And if you're prescribing it and your patient gets C. difficile, you have no argument in court, and I'm not an attorney, but the very first thing they're going to ask you is why you did not follow the American Dental Association's guidelines. And I prescribed clindamycin. I'm, I was a public health dentist. Uh, that was my go-to in the very rural areas because it works, right? But you have to make sure that the patient needs the antibiotic. Knowing what I know now, I would never prescribe clindamycin again. Um, and let's go ahead and bring our guest speaker on here. And again, for those of you asking about pre-med, take a look in your handout. Hopefully you have a copy of this. We have two resources for you, two amazing resources. You'll get up to five credits. You'll learn what to prescribe. Dr. Palmeyer shares his forms that he uses in his office, consent forms, uh, decision-making tree, and so forth. He wrote the guidelines. So take the course, get some CE, and upgrade your protocols. I am going to introduce you now to Megan Radcliffe, who worked for seven years in clinical practice, treating hundreds of patients with the help of periotrate therapy. Her clinical experience fuels her work as a team trainer with Perio Protect. She's most passionate about empowering hygienists to think outside the box by using and understanding the need for adjunctive therapies in and out of the hygiene operatory. Welcome, Megan. I'm going to bring up your presentation now. Thank you, Dr. And Rowling. So good to see you, by the way, like you're glowing today. So I'm just going to put that out there if anyone Thank agrees. you. <laughs> it took a <laughs> it took a year and a half of recovery, and that's what I wanted to really emphasize to folks that um, C. difficile is not just a bad case of diarrhea. And I hope going through this course, you understand just how disruptive it is to the entire body. It puts our patients at risk for colorectal cancer and other, other conditions, uh, infectious, I'm sorry, uh, irritable bowel syndrome is another uh, sequelae of that. So I'm going to turn this over now to our guest speaker, Megan. And again, this is promotional. We hope you'll stay on. However, we can't hold you hostage. And Megan, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much. Um, oh, 
some of this is going to be a little repetitive from what Dr. Rowling has said, um, just because this really does coincide with her message. Um, and we're so thankful for your message, by the way, Dr. Rowling. Again, she's been through so much with her health and she is just an amazing resource um, to those of you who are still in the training. So I can't recommend her enough. Um, Dr. Tom Palmer, I was lucky enough to speak with them um, during their antibiotic stewardship summit. So um, just a really, a lot of great information to be had out there. So again, if you're feeling like you need to update some of your protocols, definitely look into that antibiotic uh, stewardship webinar and be taking notes. Cause I know that I sure was as well. And now this is like one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, so helping Dr. Rowling kind of spread the word here. Um, but this was a way that I was treating my own patients as a hygienist of 10 years. If you haven't heard about Paraprotect before, uh, we have a prescription tray system that helps treat periodontal disease. So um, what we know of alternative methods of, you know, treating periodontal disease, scaling and root planning was kind of taught as the bread and butter of my own career. Um, and then I very quickly realized that we need to be able to do more, um, especially in terms of treating bacteria, because again, bacteria is going to repopul repopulate, it's going to recolonize, and eventually it's going to come back. So if we can treat bacteria on a daily basis, we're going to be able to help treat periodontal disease long term. Um, a common misconception is that we're not trying to replace scaling and root planings. We're not trying to replace perio maintenances or profies um, or any of that. We're using these trays to make those services better. Because again, we know that we can't do it all. We know that patients can't do it all as well. And when we're talking about patients, these four patients, we have told them, you know, brush more, floss more, use these um, special tools, electric toothbrushes, water picks, all of those things are absolutely amazing. And I'm still recommending them to this day, but we know that they're really only reaching so far with a traditional toothbrush. We're lucky to reach two and a half millimeters um, with floss or water pick. It could be between four and six millimeters. Again, great tools. But if you're looking at a patient with moderate to severe periodontal disease, how are we supposed to get down in these seven and eight millimeter pockets to be able to debride and alter bacteria? It's nearly impossible. So again, we needed a way that we could manage it every single day. And when we're talking about bacteria, because that's really the basis of what all of this is about, is that, um, again, we needed a way that we could manage it. So whenever we're looking at bacteria, there's about 4 million-ish bacteria uh, just on the end of a ballpoint pen. So if that kind of helps put into perspective how much bacteria is truly down in these pockets that we're not even seeing clinically, we just kind of have to know it's there and understand how it all works together. Um, so again, if you could imagine how much bacteria is down in there, it's, it's really astronomical. And that pocket becomes more anaerobic the deeper that it becomes. So just allowing those oxygen hating bacteria to replicate and to multiply. So in order to be able to manage it every single day, long-term, the best way that I knew how with my own patients was with the help of the Pair Protect tray. So there's a few points that I want you to make when you're talking to your patients, because they need to know that this is a prescription tray system. This isn't something that they can just go and purchase, you know, at your, um, supply and demand store or your chain store or your drug store for that matter. Um, again, this is a prescription wrote by the dentist and delivered by the dentist. So Paraprotect is not only FDA cleared. Um, why are we saying cleared, not approved? The FDA actually doesn't require approval on a class two medical device. The only ones that require approval are class three, which is something like a joint prosthesis or a pacemaker. Um, so if your patients happen to catch that verbiage of you saying cleared, not approved, just say it doesn't have to be approved because it's only a class two medical device. Uh, the tray is also patented. So you are not making these in your practice. You are sending them off to a certified Paraprotect lab in order to be fabricated, in which not only are they being fabricated to the patient's dentition uh, via a 3D scan, which is what we prefer, or an analog impression or model as well, um, but also to the depth of their periodontal pocket. So what the research shows is that we can actually deliver medicament up to nine millimeters which is super exciting in terms of treating moderate or severe periodontal disease. And what is it exactly that we're delivering? What is the medicament that's going inside of the tray? So we have a 1.7% hydrogen peroxide gel. And I think that we all know that we've been using hydrogen peroxide for years and years. Um, medically, in dentistry, we know that it's a wonderful broad spectrum antimicrobial, as well as a wonderful wound cleaner. And again, we're going to kind of talk about that as well. But specifically at 1.7%, 
we're targeting anaerobic bacteria. So unlike when patients would rinse with full strength hydrogen peroxide and we ran the risk of killing our good bacteria as well as our bad bacteria, we don't run that risk when we're using a low dose hydrogen peroxide. So essentially we're creating more of an oxygen rich environment at the expense of the bad bacteria. And the whole science behind the tray, and again, how we're delivering this medicament, is truly about the tray. You can't have one without the other. You can't do the tray without the gel, and you can't do the gel without the tray. The tray has an inner peripheral seal along the gingival margin, and that's what's going to push the medicament to the base of the pocket. So the problem, additionally, with traditional modalities of treating periodontal disease is that we've never been able to overcome the curricular fluid because it's ever flowing. So with the help of the tray, placing a pressure point at the gingival margin, we're gonna be able to push that medicament down into the sulcus, pass the curricular fluid to the base of the pocket. So that's essentially Paraprotect in a nutshell is, is the trays and the gel, which makes my job really easy. Um, and I think it's important to explain to patients that our immune systems are truly like a battery. So the more chronic low-grade infections that we place in our immune systems, the quicker we're going to see that battery fade. So I usually try to look at my top three when I'm looking at comorbidities. I'm looking for cardiovascular diseases, respiratory diseases, and obviously diabetes. Those are my top three that I'm really looking at because a lot of the population of your patients are going to be coming in with these top three. So we need to be explaining to them that, hey, there is a systemic connection between the bacteria in your mouth and what you have going on systemically. And we know that certain bacteria are, again, related to certain other immune responses. So if we can lower bacterial load in the mouth, lessen the chance of a bacteremia, that's going to be less bacteria throughout the bloodstream, again, triggering immune responses in other areas of the body. And when we're talking about bacteria, I do want to discuss our in vitro study. This was done in our 1.7% hydrogen peroxide gel. And just let me kind of break some of this down for you. So number one, anything that you see that's um, green on the slide is a live bacteria and red is dead bacteria. And this study was solely done on streptococcus mutans, as you know, is associated with decay, just like Dr. Rowling was discussing. So a few reasons why we did that. Number one, strep mutans has one of the thickest matrices to be able to penetrate. So we knew that if we could penetrate strep mutans, we were going to be equally as effective against periopathogens as well. The other part of this is that we already know that hydrogen peroxide is extremely effective against periopathogens because the majority of them that are causing disease are gram-negative anaerobic. So again, hydrogen peroxide breaking down oxygen and water, we're delivering oxygen to an anaerobic environment. Now, your patients will only wear perio gel for 10 to 15 minutes. Um, 10 minutes is really where it starts to kill bacteria. 15 is where they're getting their full oxygenating benefits. And once the gel reaches saliva, it actually starts to break down after about 17 minutes. So they're going to lose their antimicrobial properties after that time frame. So don't tell them 20, don't tell them 30. Again, at 17 minutes is kind of our cap. So just tell them 10 to 15, keep it super simple. And that very first slide is where we let bacteria grow, again, strep mutans for three days. And we are like, you know what, we're going to let it grow and then we're going to try and treat it. And we're going to see what happens. So in the middle slide is where we treated it for just five minutes, again, after three days. And as you can see, not a whole lot has happened. <laughs> Only five minutes has passed. The key is really within that first seven to 10 minutes range, again, like we just discussed. So not a whole lot has happened after five minutes. And the very last slide is where we treated it for 10 minutes and we were able to kill 100% of surface strep mutans within that time. So I encourage my clinicians and my offices to be looking at different ways that we can help treat, again, not only periodontal disease, but also your high caries risk patients as well. We can assume that if we're killing the number one bacteria associated with decay, patients who are compliantly wearing Paraprotect are gonna have a much decreased rate of caries over those patients who are not. And when we're talking a little bit more about hydrogen peroxide, again, we mentioned that it's a wonderful broad spectrum antimicrobial, as well as a wonderful wound cleaner. So I've been encouraging my offices to classify and to think about what are we constituting as a wound? We know that it has inflammation. We know that it has redness. We know that it has bleeding. And I want you to think about a periodontal pocket. It has all of those classifications. So essentially we are treating 
chronic wounds. And the best way to do that is with the help of the hydrogen peroxide, because we're going to facilitate healing by delivering oxygen. So the other cool part about this is that we're going to be able to disrupt that slimy biofilm matrix to help make biofilm and plaque easier to remove, help debride the bacterial cell wall, deliver oxygen to those anaerobic environments. Uh, my favorite part about hydrogen peroxide as a hygienist was the fact that it actually helps denature calculus deposits. So I want you to start thinking and viewing calculus essentially as a protein skeleton. It's just simply been there too long. Now it's calcified and it's made up of protein chains. So the hydrogen peroxide is going to go on, held on contact via the tray, and it's going to start to break it down by breaking those protein chains. So now calculus is much easier to remove and it actually keeps it from rebuilding. So if there's any hygienists in here, this is going to make your life so much easier no allergic reactions because we're making hydrogen peroxide naturally. Every single one of us, every single day in our lungs, our liver, our white blood cells, pregnant women are even producing this in their breast milk. So it's, it's wonderful for them as well. So just reassure your patients that, Hey, if you have heard anything about hydrogen peroxide, just know that you are actually making it naturally. And again, if we were at one time telling patients don't use hydrogen peroxide, what we really should have been telling them is, don't use hydrogen peroxide at 3% or above. Again, it's been shown um, to be extremely effective at 1.7% as well as extremely safe. Um, and there was a six year study that followed patients who used it every single day, multiple times a day. There was no carcinogenic effects, no adverse, adverse events. So again, do know that this is safe for your patients. Um, Dr. Rowling has also given multiple webinars on xerostomia and the silver tsunami. Um, so if you've ever had a chance to view those webinars, absolutely love them, ton of information. Um, the reason why I'm discussing this is because we have two different perio gels. The original perio gel is sweetened with saccharin, therefore you're gonna get a very minty flavor because of that. But now we also have a xylitol gel, which as you know, is a natural plant sugar. Um, so it's gonna come with a much more mild mint flavor in comparison, but we know that xylitol, again, can be really effective against caries prevention, help increase salivary flow, balance pH in the mouth. So I feel like a lot of my new offices are really leaning towards that xylitol gel just because of those added properties. Um, once, you know, if you're interested in signing on, we can always talk about pricing of the gels and all of that. Um, but it is important to know those differences. Um, and also to know that sometimes xylitol can be irritating to patients with stomach problems or gastric issues. Again, we're not swallowing large amounts of gel, um, but we do want to be keeping an eye on those medical histories for those patients who have maybe marked stomach problems or gastric issues. Um, patients are going to use about eight or nine tubes of gel in a year, um, and you're supplying them with two to three tubes at the delivery of their appointment. When they're wearing it twice a day, it's going to go, they're going to go through a tube of gel in about three weeks versus when you bump them down to once a day, it's, they're going to go through it in about six weeks. So again, it's important for us to know this and as well as the patient because they need to have enough gel to support the amount of times that we've recommended them to wear trays. There's going to be a very gradual lightening effect of the enamel um, when we're utilizing a 1.7% hydrogen peroxide. Very low chance of sensitivity, again, because that concentration is so low, especially in comparison to carbamide peroxide. 10% um, carbamide peroxide equates to about 3.3% hydrogen peroxide. So when we're looking at high concentrations of carbamide, 25, 35, 45%, again, do know that those concentrations are much higher than just a 1.7% hydrogen peroxide. So for your patients who are looking to whiten, but also to help treat their gingivitis or help treat their periodontal disease, this is a really great way that we can do that. The tray is kind of multi-use also in the aspect that you can actually help treat sensitivity or help treat a high caries risk or a xerostomic patient by applying other fluoridated products inside of the pair protect tray. So here's just a couple of, of examples on the screen. I know a couple of my offices are using um, other products as well. So whatever you're most comfortable with, again, do know that you can use these types of products inside of the pair protect tray. Different types of patients that, again, we could be using this on. We have preventative patients, um, patients with bad breath. This is a huge one. Um, I want you to start kind of using bad breath as a precursor to periodontal disease and explaining to patients that what we know now is that the same bacteria that's causing bad breath is actually what's causing periodontal disease long-term. Uh, so Porphyrmonas gingivalis, PG being one of the biggest ones involved in this, TF, FN. So do know that we should be addressing bad breath and we should be looking to try and treat it. 
We have our maintenance patients as well. This is really where Paraprotect started, was treating patients in refractory perio. So those patients who come back with bleeding and pocketing after scaling and root planing, even multiple rounds of scaling and root planing. And there can be a multitude of reasons why this happens. But to me, I believe that it's because there are actually three bacteria that are resistant to scaling and root planing. It's AA, PG, and TF. And again, those are the three most likely to cause periodontal disease. So what that tells us is, is that if we can't manage them while we're doing scaling and root planings because they're resistant, then we're leaving them behind. And not only are we leaving them behind, but we just took an instrument below the gum line and disrupted the colony. So now they want to come back with a vengeance. So this is why it's so important that we look to treat patients after scaling and root planing that we're actually managing bacteria. The majority of scaling and root planing is about managing the deposit. So now we need a way that we can manage that bacteria. So here's our goals with Paraprotect. I don't expect you to read these verbatim to your patients, but obviously we want them to be able to keep their bone and not lose any more bone if there has been bone loss. Avoid multiple rounds of scaling and root planing. Potentially avoid surgery. Not in all instances, of course, it's just gonna depend on severity, um, but provide better quality of life, wider teeth, fresher breath, more confidence, make maintenance appointments easier and shorter, which I know I was thankful for as a hygienist, and then obviously improving general health and wellness. And then here's a list of our patient candidates, just to kind of recap, perio maintenance patients, gingivitis patients, 10 bleeding points or more. We've got our new perio patients where you could actually be utilizing this before scaling and root planing. If I have any implant docs um, in here, this is a wonderful way that you can help treat your implant patients as well. Restorative, bad breath, whitening, preventative, and then post-orthodontic patients as well. And again, one of the reasons why this is so important is because we need to be able to manage bacteria. And according to the National Institute of Health, there's about a 70% chance that we're creating a bacteremia or a chance of a bacteremia when we're doing these scaling procedures. So this is why it's so important. There's a 100% chance we do an extraction. So hygienists, we're really not far off. This is one of our six-month clinical trials. We have multiple six-month clinical trials as well as multiple research. Um, if you go to paraprotect.com forward slash claims, you can find all of that information there. Um, this is just one of the bigger ones that resonates with me and again, hygienists um, all across the world because this shows that Paraprotect trays is actually more effective before and after scaling and root planing than just scaling and root planing alone at both two and 10 weeks post scaling and root planing and both shallow and deep pockets greater than five millimeters. So a lot of studies really focus on deep pockets. We actually did both. So it's kind of neat to be able to see this science. And again, now we understand why. But the whole basis of this is to implement it into our protocol. So we're telling patients, this is how we treat periodontal disease in this practice. Again, we don't want to allow disease to progress. We don't want to allow bacteria to mature. So we need to be presenting this to patients. We need to be planting the seed and we have to be educating them because I truly believe that when they understand why they need treatment is when they're gonna accept treatment. And it's so easy to use one to two times a day, 10 to 15 minutes. Again, it's comfortable, it's non-invasive. This is an investment in their health, um, but they're gonna have trays for a very long time. Again, five to seven years, and they're gonna get those, um, what we like to call happy side effects of wider teeth and fresher breath. Again, we do accept 3D scans for those of you who are digital um, and we prefer them, but we also like analog impressions as well, um, as well as models. So again, we're not singling you out, but, um, but do know that uh, you have the, that technology available to you. This is what your lab case would look like coming back from the lab. So you do have upper and lower trays, as well as a travel case, a home care kit, tube squeeze instructions and three tubes of perio gel. So we just kind of revamped our packaging and we're super excited about it. We get compliments on it all the time. Um, and again, this is a way that you have really upscaled what you're delivering to those patients and patients are just absolutely thrilled with this. So again, this is what you're getting um, with, your, with your cases. If you want to tap that banner up at the top, you can reach out to us here at Paro Protect. Um, if you want to schedule a training, you can actually reach out to us online um, using a specific code. You should be able to use Dental CE. If that doesn't work, please let me know. Um, but you can also use code OXYGEN and that should discount your training. So again, please feel free to tap that banner. Um, let's get you scheduled for a training. Let's get the team up to speed. We do have two different codes that you can utilize for the trays. Um, so do know that these are ADA um, CDT billable codes. 
And again, if you guys have any questions, please throw them into the chat. More than happy to help um, you in your journey. And our goal is the same as your goal. We want to achieve healthier patients and your success is going to be our success. And I think that we're right there on time. So again, if anyone has any questions, please let me know. I'm more than happy to help. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rowling. I have uh, a couple of announcements here. A copy of Megan's presentation is in your course folder. So it's information you can take back to your practice on Monday and share with your colleagues. Um, the green banner at the top of the screen will take you to Perio Protect. And the code again was dental CE. Yes, it okay. should be. If that doesn't work, use code OXYGEN. <laughs> okay, dental CE or OXYGEN. Um, and when you tap on that banner, you can actually save that URL bookmark it to your device to um, take it back uh, to your offices on Monday. Any questions for Megan? Megan, what about insurance billing? Can you just very quickly mention that? Yeah, of course. Again, these are our two CDT billable codes. We do have two codes, one for the maxillary and one for the mandibular. The biggest question I get is, is this covered by insurance? Right. Um, and I actually have seen it covered um, by some insurances. Again, it's not all, and it's never covered at 100%, or at least not that I've seen, anywhere between 30 and 50%. But allowing patients to understand that regardless of what their insurance covers, you're not treating them based on their insurance, right? So again, we really need to kind of convey this message to patients and let them know that while insurance is extremely beneficial, it's unfortunately not an end-all be-all. And when they don't cover procedures, it's just strictly because it's not wrote into their insurance contracts. And I know for a fact that uh, many of us invest more in what we pay for our dog's cleanings. Um, <laughs> they're not covered. I have two and I was just hit with that bill and I went, whoa. Um, so I wish we had Perio Protect for the, the veterinary side of I things. Know, right? <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today, Megan. And I appreciate everyone for joining us today. And I want to thank Perio Protect for supporting our, our cause here to get the word out. Uh, oh. Reach out to Perio Protect because it is a game changer um, if you're able to tackle this inflammation early on. And this is what the American Dental Association is stating now, too. We need to get our patients in earlier and treat this um, inflammation that can lead to systemic disease. So, and also put them at other risk for things like C. difficile. So thank you, Megan, and thank you everybody for being here. We're going to go ahead and sign out. You will be automatically redirected to the screen to complete the quiz for CE credit. And we thank you also um, for taking our other classes. So next week we have a full week line up and this course will be available on demand and it will be live again in July. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.